All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first debate of the year. It is on dress code. We have the teacher side, which is for dress code, and we have the student side, which is against dress code. I have two microphones. One microphone will be given to the teachers, one to the students. Each team will be allowed to speak into their microphone when it is their turn. Please do not speak into your microphone if it is not your turn. And please, audience, be respectful. And let's get into it. So obviously, we are for uh, continuing the dress code here at Schmokin area. And our opening statement is, I understand that this is a contentious issue that our opponents, the members of the student body, are really looking forward to voicing their opinions as to why they believe they're being educated in the facility that, per what many of my students have said, closer resembles a correctional institution or a jail than a seat of knowledge and learning, partly due to our dress code rules. Our goal this afternoon is to prove the benefits of what the school dress code has provided since being implemented several years ago. Our team will be coming from the perspective of having ex experienced the Schmokin area, both pre-dress code and during the implementation phase. Several of the views expressed will simply be what we have personally experienced in the classroom and office areas. So you have to understand that we were here before dress code and obviously during that phase. First point that I'd like to make is that since implementation of the dress code, the amount of students sleeping in my classes has dropped dramatically. I have attributed this to students actually having to get up and get ready in, for the day. Per ProCon.org, research shows that the quality of work improves when performed by individuals who dress up. One study found that participants who wore formal business attire, such as suits, scored higher on cognitive tests with specific increases in abstract thinking. With this statement in mind, let's consider for a moment that the main purpose of what the main purpose of school is. The main purpose of this institution is to prepare students for their futures through education and learning. We have a means to improve our students' ability and learning capabilities by teaching them how to prepare themselves each day with a learning mindset, then why would we not utilize this to the student's benefit? Our second point that we'd like to make is that dress code at Schmokin area makes much more sense for the demographic of student that we serve. Our community overall is not well off financially. The dress code allows students' families to buy a small number of outfits for school that can be washed and reused for the entire school year. As shirts and pants are devoid of specific graphics, emblems, and logos, no one cares if you wear the same collared shirt once a week. Whereas if you wear the same Metallica or any other type of graphic t-shirt constantly, there is brand recognition. So as a result, most students desire a greater variety in school wardrobes, which translates into huge back-to-school clothing bills. Another major advantage for financially disadvantaged families is that there is a greater acceptance of hand-me-downs. Families are able to save money by using clothing from older children uh, to younger ones. Since we know that sometimes children grow fast and move through clothing sizes quickly, families are able to save the barely used dress code clothing and use it for a sibling. A third reason within serving our school's demographics is our dress code is meant to lower anxiety. The hell is that? A third reason within serving our school's demographic is that our dress code is meant to lower anxiety levels of students who are in lower socioeconomic groups. Many students who attend school are worried about how they look to their peers who are of a higher socioeconomic level than they are. The idea is that with a dress code, all students are wearing very similar clothing, that there are not huge differences between them. And as a result, students can focus more on learning than what they are wearing. The third point, and really where this whole concept of a dress code hit the mainstream, is school safety. The Columbine tragedy, which occurred before all of you were born, but still very much ingrained in our memories, was the first of its kind of school shootings. Two students were able to take weapons into the school using trench coats with very deep pockets to conceal weapons in them. The idea behind not allowing jackets and hoodies during the school day is rooted from this tragedy, so it's more difficult to conceal weapons and promote a safer environment. In addition to this, Students were constantly wearing their hoods up in order to conceal earphones that prevented them from properly listening to directions and lectures in class. Your teachers and administrators want you to get the best education you can get, allowing us to actually see your face and make sure that you are paying attention with, and that's only going to help you.
Thank you. There are many more points that can be made in defense of the current dress code smoking area. These are just a few meant to as a conversation starter. Our school environment tends to be very reactive instead of proactive. We have a major policy change is likely due to an event that has happened and as a result of observed behaviors. We don't like putting rules in place that we don't have to enforce to begin with. So it's there for a reason. Okay. So you talked about how students slept less in class, especially in your class, mm -hmm. after the dress code was enacted, yeah. correct? Okay, um, that is anecdotal evidence. That is one specific case. That is not all cases. That is not many cases. That is one. This does not necessarily prove that the dress code as a whole among all schools, or at least at our school, has helped. It's specifically your class. That's one out of all the classrooms in our school, out of all the schools in the state, out of all the states in the country. You also mentioned how um, having a dress code reduces like um, violence in our schools with the trench coat examples of the Columbine shooters. Um, with our school, we, as soon as you enter the building, you have to go to security. If you're not allowed to wear certain things um, in homeroom, you'll be forced to take your hoodie off. Like, there's no way um, to prove that dress code will... Um, dress code explicitly stops gun violence in schools. You also talked about cost effectiveness per family and how it's um, incredibly cheap. The average family in the United States has two and a half children. Um, obviously, it doesn't work for half a child, but empirical data. We'll give you that. Okay. Buying one polo and one khaki for an entire week of school is highly ineffective and not cost efficient when it comes to washing those clothes because you'd have to be doing the wash five times a week, which really racks up bills and is not cost effective. If you want it to be cost effective, you would have to go with at least two to three polos, two to three pairs of khakis, and for the winter months, two long sleeve shirts and two, pa two pairs of pants. This adds up to a total of $300 per family and if you take into account that there are hand-me-downs, this is still $120 per year at minimum for each family to use on new clothes for their children because um, kids grow over time, they grow over the years, and they have to change their sizes. The average annual income per family in Shemokin is $29,578, according to the PA census. Average billing in Pennsylvania is $1,800 or $1,851 a month, that takes it down to a total of $7,366 left to play with. <sighs> then there's also grocery costs, which is $3,600 per year. That takes it down to a little over $3,200, or sorry, $3,366 to be exact. And then you have other needs, such as what happens if clothes get ripped, things like that. This is a huge stress on families that don't have a lot of money, especially in our area, which is um, I, I, I don't know exactly what the poverty line like percentage is here, but I know it's, it's very high and that most families around here don't have the money to afford that kind of stuff and at the rate that it's happening. You made the point that uh, having a dress code causes less bullying. Well, you, well, being, well, an outfit doesn't necessarily, well, it doesn't necessarily cause bullying, or it's not really a big, like, factor of bullying. You still get bullied for other things that have nothing, that can have nothing to do with clothing. And if someone bullies you about a type of shirt you wear, they're wearing, they're also wearing a type of shirt that can also cause bullying. So, like, it does, you can't really go anywhere with that. And also, you mentioned hand-me-downs and stuff like that. People people can be cruel and can also start bullying because of that. So, yes. Uh, finally, you talked about quality of work improvement. Um, according to a document that was, uh, sorry, I don't want to explain this in a way that doesn't sound pretentious. Uh, according to the PA School Performance dot org which has an Excel sheet of all schools in Pennsylvania and all of their grades in terms of keystones and, and uh, PSSAs. Shemokin, out of seven schools, had the second, or sorry, the third lowest ELA pass rate the year this dress code was enacted. 
MCA was uh, shortly behind them and then followed by Shikalemi. Our algebra pass rate was the lowest that year. Danville, Southern, Mount Carmel, Shikalemi, Sealands, Grove and Line Mountain are the other six schools. I forgot to mention that. And our biology pass rate was also the lowest out of all seven of those schools. And this was the year the dress code was enacted. If you go back a year, our percentages were up, up by about six to seven percent. And there are other factors that I'd like to get into during our time. All right. So the year the dress code was enacted at Chamokin Area High School was 2016 and 2017. According to the same website I used in my rebuttal, paschoolperformance.org, which has all of the stats from 2016, 2017, 2015, 2016, and so on, back to about 2013 or 2012, has multiple stats for each school, including attendance rate, graduation rate, final academic score, and calculated score. This is calculated score and final academic score are total out of 100 and basically rate your school on a scale from 1 to 100. Our attendance rate in 2016 to 2017, which was the year the dress code was enacted, was 86.92%. That is the lowest out of all of the other six schools, Danville, Southern, Mount Carmel, Shikalemi, Sealands Grove, and Line Mountain. The closest person to us was Mount Carmel with a 3.5% difference in attendance at 90.48%. Our cohort graduation rate in that same year was 76.84%, the, again, lowest out of all the other schools close by. Closest again was Mount Carmel with 84.11%, which is a 7.6% uh, difference. Our final academic score was 65.7 out of 100, which is third overall, Mount Carmel and Chickalemi falling slightly behind. And calculated score was 64.76, again, Mount Carmel and Chickalemi below us. However, all of these other schools do not have dress code, we do. This does not necessarily mean that the dress code is the purpose and problem for all of those things, but it is the one largest outlier comparatively to all these other schools. And when you take Mount Carmel and Chickalemi, which are schools with very similar demographics, very similar grades, and overall are very similar to us, and you take the one major outlier between our school and theirs, which is the dress code, you see that maybe it's not necessarily a causation, but it does happen across the board at a very high rate, and it is largely among these stats. Next, from the Shimokin policy page for dress code, quote, the following dress and grooming requirements have been developed to ensure the safety and welfare of the students and the order of the school and to maintain an environment conductive to learning. According to Mr. Hockenbrock, at one of our class meetings, he said that before dress code was enacted, we had very low write-ups, lower than anything that we've seen in the past five years. Of course, 2020 was most likely very close due to it being a virtual year, not many students being in school, but it was the lowest that we've seen write-ups in those six years. Again, from the policy page, quote, the requirements in this policy have been developed to impose the minimal amount of economic burden on families as possible when protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the students and the order of the school. When a student gets dress coded, oftentimes the student likes to make a scene because students don't like to be told what they're supposed to wear. Students like to wear what they want to wear. When you dress code a student, that causes that student to then get upset and cause a scene, oftentimes. This takes away from other students' abilities to learn and other students' education time because a teacher now has to focus on the student who's making the scene about the dress code and not so much about education, which is what we all value. We all want education, and that's a great thing. It also talks about safety and welfare of the students and economic burden on families. As I discussed in our rebuttal, the economic burden is almost uh, or it's very high because of the fact that you need to buy five pairs of clothes for an entire school year, and that costs $300 across two and a half children. Safety is a big factor. However, at this, or sorry, safety is a big factor. However, at the entrance to the school, there are metal detectors. We have security guards who check bags. If you were to attempt to sneak something in with a or a non-restrictive dress code that may allow hoodies, or may allow trench coats and and things like that, you won't be able to 99.9% .9 of the time because most of the things that students want to sneak in to cause destruction are made of metal, which can be picked up by the metal detectors or searched through a student's bag. 
points. Um, yeah, we're ready. Okay. Two thousand, two thousand, sixteen, two thousand, seventeen. About five years ago, I'd say the last ten, but especially the last five, we were a transient school. We've seen more students come uh, transfer in than ever before. We are um, a low socioeconomic city. Um, I live here. I can see this. We are the cheapest place to live. So what we're seeing is kids coming in, they're moving in um, that are grade levels behind. So they're coming from schools in the city and they're grade levels behind. So that would help explain some of our low Keystone and PSSA scores. We've always been low. It is what it is. We've been low um, before the dress code. We've been low before the pandemic. We're low after the dress code. We're low after the pandemic. So also the line changes every year as far as passing rates. So that changes every year, but we've always been low. We were low before and, and we're getting lower, um, not because from our data, not because of the dress code, but because of students are transferring in grade levels behind um, academics. So, so they're behind. Also, um, from now on, we quote sources. We have some nice journals up here and Jacob's quoting Mr. Hockenbrock, who, who just makes up stats as he goes. We love the guy, we work with the guy, but we have journals we're gonna pull our sources from, not Mr. Hockenbrock. Do you have anything? Another thing that um, we had talked about over here was the cost of clothing. And I know you had cited some um, sources or some information about the cost being, you know, a little over $300 if you have those 2.5 kids, which may be the case. You know, Walmart typically has their shirts back to school. We go shopping a lot here, about five bucks there but we also do have our clothing closet and a lot of our kids just from our experience downstairs do take advantage of that where they have used those resources where um, literally that entire room over there is wall-to-wall -wall clothes um, in every size pants shoes belts um, really anything that you can look for coats um, all that good stuff that does supplement for our families that maybe it would be a burden where they only could buy two or three polos or two or three pairs of khakis you know, we do have that those resources here where we supplement. And that is where your teachers where, you know, they do dress down days and things like that. That money goes towards buying things for the clothing closet for our students here. And just to clear up a few other things. Um, in in my opening statement where I was describing the trench coats and everything, that was not necessarily saying that, oh, we eliminate trench coats and hoodies, we eliminate violence in the school. It makes it that it makes it more difficult for things to be concealed. Now, I do appreciate you stating about how they come through security and things like that. And we know that every single object that could be harmful or anything such as, you know, I don't know, vape sliders and things like that. None of that gets through dress code or through the metal detector. And we have no vaping situations in this school whatsoever. So there are loopholes, and the idea is that it makes it more difficult to conceal things. Not necessarily, I'm not going to go as far as saying it's going to prevent violence necessarily. Also, um, Mount Carmel does have a dress code, very similar to ours. Um, so it, it works a little bit differently, but it is somewhat similar. They must wear polos at times too. Um, if they're not wearing Mount Carmel area shirts, at least that's as, how it was at least two years ago. Um, so um, I think that mostly covers it. As for the students sleeping in my class, you are correct. I am only taking from what I saw personally. But did what was the catalyst? Why was there a difference between before dress code and after dress code that happened to line up? Is that, you know possibly that it's not the dress code maybe but it's coincidence that it just happened to change during that time period uh i'd like to apologize first and foremost for the mount carmel statistic i checked their webpage. i could not find a dress code so Fine. because of that i assume they did not have one i apologize I'm good. okay i would like it to get into how um dress code policies can be discriminatory so i'm gonna start off with gender base um, with the majority of the dress codes, it can lead to a lot of sexualization of women and girls. 
Um, about 90% of dress codes prohibit clothes typically worn by girls, such as shorter length skirts, spaghetti, um, spaghetti strap shirts, and leggings, while 69% um, prohibit clothes typically worn by men, such as muscle shirts and sagging pants. Um, and with a lot of dress codes, it makes it seem like girls' bodies are a distraction and are to blame for a boy's lack of focus, but that's not true. Um, and, mm, Yeah, thank you. And then also racially, there are some disparities, especially in loss of learning. Black students are seven times more likely to receive exclusionary discipline for dress code violation than their white peers. And with this exclusionary discipline comes increased risk of failing standardized tests, increased rates of dropouts and incarcerations. And there are some like true stories um, in schools around the country where black hair or tip, uh, clothing typically worn by other minorities and people of color is seen by distracting. Like in um, Georgia at this Mystic Valley Regional Center, two black girls were issued multiple detentions because their distracting hairstyles violated dress code. Um, I personally, I don't see their um, dress code as distracting. All they had was extensions, normal grades went a little bit past their shoulders. And then we have in, also in Georgia, uh, Andrew Johnson, he was forced to um, cut his dreads off before a match because it violated the rules somehow. In 2019, another school in Atlanta had posters displayed which showed um, inappropriate haircuts with black students. Um, for appropriate, there was like just fades, inappropriate, they showed designs on the side of the heads and just normal braids for black girls. Um, I think that's all I have. Owen? I would just like to say one of the points you made was that kids keep falling asleep in your class. And I would like to say, like, you said this started at the beginning of the dress code, or right. less kids are falling asleep, or more kids are falling asleep? Less. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, he thought you said more, and so he was going to say, you're getting old. Uh, <laughs> no. Now I'd like to say, you are getting younger and fresh. <laughs> Um, so I would like to start. I agree that dress codes are uh, discriminatory to a point. Okay, um, those examples from Georgia, I believe you said Georgia. Um, yeah, that's terrible. What I'm happy to say is that I don't think that we have policies in our dress code here that would be racially discriminatory. And if there are, and I'm just not smart enough to see it, just very possible. Um, then I hope that we can find out, find that out, and get that changed. You know, but I'm pretty happy that um, I don't think ours is discriminatory in that way. And like I said, maybe it is. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to, and this is Lesher's opinion, when it comes to females and discriminatory within the um, dress code, yeah, that's societal, and not to say that it's right, but. Um, I don't know that I have a good answer for that because you're you're absolutely right. It is typically much more limiting to females because it's not unusual for what guys wear. Um, it definitely cuts down on um, where a female student would wear. But um, I don't know that I have an answer for that one. And I don't know that it is appropriate for a school district itself like us to um, address that. I think that has to be a complete societal change before we can, you know, put some type of policy to fix that in place. And that's, you know. Yeah, just to piggyback off of that is the only other. Um, he's back as the no, only. No, 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 no. As the only other female debating, um, absolutely. You know, a lot of those, like he said, are rooted in society, and and they go back to when you know females were probably expected to wear slacks and, and all that good stuff, right? So that does make sense. Um, but just like everything else here from our experience, you know, there has to be a line somewhere. So where do you draw the line? So um, it it does get confusing, but you're not wrong when it when you say like it can for girls feel a little bit discriminatory because that's how it was, like Mr. Lesher said, with society and, and different things. But um, you made a lot of great points with that, and I can't say that I 100% disagree with you on that one.
Mikhail, I want to compliment you. Thank you for using research and stats. And unlike quoting Mr. Hockenbrock and Owen was going to um, he was going to quote Mr. Durr and use stats from Mr. Durr, but thank you for not allowing him to do that because that would have hurt. Um, real quick, that one incident, I don't have an answer for the girls. You have research, but the incident in Georgia, it was wrestling and it was a safety issue. You can't have long hair wrestling. You either have to cut your hair or wear a cap. So uh, I, I help out coach wrestling. So I think that it was either cut your hair or don't wrestle. So it's not like they made him cut his hair in order to wrestle, but that is a safety concern. And that is a, a, a rule in wrestling about long hair. It has to be a certain length for safety or, or wear a cap. Um, again, I thank you. Agam complimented me for looking nice again. Thank you. I'm, I'm in dress code. I thank you. I do look nice. I think you were number seven today. And, uh, two things, and I'll let it go with this is, um, uh, when you think about, um, the dress code, I want to see, um, I want to see Jacob Erdman in leggings and think of this three words Jaden McKean's shorts. <laughs> you got to do that. Thank you guys for coming. No, good. No, 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 no